Hello everyone, my name is Nick Lyle, and I'm the lead trainer at Waterloo Hydrogeologic. We're a software company that makes tools for specialists dealing with environmental problems. Today I'll be talking to you about when and why you should be using particle tracking to calculate wellhead protection areas. I'll also be giving a demo for how easily this can be done in Visual Modulo Flex at the end. Stick around for it, especially if you're interested to see exactly how this can be done in our software step by step. Let me first give some quick, less technical background about what a wellhead protection area is and why we define them. All the water a well pumps must have entered the ground from somewhere, typically as recharge from precipitation trickling through the ground to the water table. Because of this, for every well, there is a quote unquote zone of contribution, also called a capture zone by some authorities where any water that enters the water table in that zone will eventually make it to the well. This also means that any contaminant that enters the groundwater in that zone will also make it to the well, assuming that it doesn't degrade into something harmless first. So regulators establish so-called wellhead protection areas around wells where certain activities or land uses are prohibited. How are these wellhead protection areas determined? Often some arbitrary distance from the well is used, maybe 2,000 feet. Sometimes the area is defined by mapping the places where the well is causing significant groundwater drawdown, the quote unquote zone of influence, and declaring that to be the wellhead protection area. There are more sophisticated methods like the EPA's uniform flow model, which calculates the capture zone based on the well's pumping rate and the aquifer properties. However, it assumes a highly simplified geology and geometry and also that the well is unconfined. Other analytical methods exist, all of which are only valid for isotropic aquifers with simple regional flow gradients. These methods have problems. Concisely, none of them actually calculate what the zone of contribution to the well is. Assuming appropriate conditions prevail, analytical methods will likely come the closest, but they may have unacceptable inaccuracies. These methods might overestimate the zone of contribution, they might underestimate it, they might even put it in a place that doesn't overlap with the actual zone of contribution at all. This is especially true if the well is in a confined aquifer, since by definition, confined aquifers do not receive recharge from directly above. The capture zone for a well in a confined aquifer might be very far away from the well itself. For these reasons, the best, but also the most intensive way to calculate a wellhead protection area is with a numerical model using a technique called particle tracking. A numerical model is a computer simulation of groundwater flow and commonly used engines include modflow and fee flow. These models allow for arbitrary complexity and hence can be made as physically realistic as practical. The results of the numerical model can then be processed by a particle tracking software, such as ModPath, which is a free and open source tool developed by the US Geological Survey, which can then calculate the paths that groundwater flows in. Specifically, for wellhead protection area problems, they allow you to calculate the paths that any water flowing to the well took. So here's a recommended workflow. First, a numerical model must be built which reasonably matches the calibration data. It's a good idea to use Visual Modflow Flex to build this model as it will save you time and thus money. This numerical model will output a prediction of groundwater flow velocities, which can then be used to calculate flow paths. Of course, building these models is a complex topic and I'm skipping a lot of steps here. If you're interested in learning how to build a groundwater model, Waterloo Hydrogeologic offers courses. We have more information on our website. In the next step, some particle ending points must be defined. Note that for wellhead protection area problems, we actually work with a backwards problem. We specify where groundwater flows terminated and backwards calculate where the groundwater flow started from. The typical practice is to place many particles in stacked rings around a well screen. Keep in mind that the capture zone for the top of the well screen might actually be slightly different than the capture zone for the bottom of the well screen, which is why we use multiple stacked rings. In this illustration, I've only shown a few particles, but generally you should use as many particles as is practical. Particle tracking software usually runs pretty quickly, even with thousands of particles. Next, the model results and the particle ending points should be given to a particle tracking software like ModPath or ModPath3DU for unstructured modular grids. The particles should be specified as being backwards tracking as they are tracked backwards from their ending point. ModPath will use this information to calculate the well's capture zone. 
Incidentally, I should note that all these tasks can be done easily uh, using an interface in Visual Modular Flex, which is why we recommend our software to hydrogeologists looking to speed up their workflows. Finally, the mod path outputs should be processed so that the origin point for each path line is extracted. These origin points can then be brought into GIS where they can be used to calculate the zone of contribution. Additionally, a concave hull can be drawn around the path lines representing the 2D projection of the well's capture zone. Although the well may not receive direct water recharge in this zone, denapple spills in the zone would still be of some concern, so they typically have some land use restrictions. Finally, it's common to calculate the zone of contribution for five years, 10 years, etc., according to the applicable regulations. Here are the sources for the figures from this presentation. And now I'll give a step-by-step -step demo using Visual Mod Flow Flex. Okay, so I've got Visual Mod Flow Flex open and I'll show you how to do this in the interface. Uh, before I jump off, uh, let me just quickly explain this model. So I've got a site scale model here something like five kilometers by four kilometers. And this is a three layer model. So if I turn on the row view here, we can see that we've got an unconfined upper layer with generally high hydraulic conductivities. We've got a leaky confining layer, which is actually discontinuous across the model domain. As we can see here, it actually pinches out a little bit. And in this bottom layer, we've got this, this semi-confined layer as for the boundary conditions, we have uh, five wells in this model, and the well that we'll be doing particle tracking is this one right here. This uh, is probably difficult to read, but it's uh, IWSW12A down here. For the other boundary conditions, we have a RIV boundary condition on the first layer. We have uh, recharge and evapotranspiration on the first layer. Uh, I won't turn them on, but the recharge is highest here in the northwest corner at about, I think, 28 inches per year. It's about 15 inches per year over here, and it's zero on the southern and eastern edges of the model. And additionally, there's a constant head boundary condition representing regional flow at the very bottom layer. This model already runs and converges, so I can show you the results. As you might expect, in the first layer, heads are highest in the northwest corner and are lowest towards the river in the south and east. And the bottom layers, heads are highest in the north. Of course, we've got these spots here from these industrial wells uh, that are, are low zones, but are also low along the south and east corners. For the calibration data, if I open it up in the calibration dashboard, we can see that the model generally looks pretty decently calibrated. And based on this and you know my expert knowledge about the site, I can feel confident that the model results are at least credible. So now I'll show you how to do particle tracking. To do that, I want to find the define particle step here under the select the next step step. So I'll click on it. And this will open up the screen. Now for doing particle tracking with wells, by far the most straightforward way would be to just use the assign using wells option. So I'll select under toolbox assign and I'll select using well object. So now I want to select which well group off of the model explorer that I'll be using. So if you use particle tracking like this, you'll use all the wells in a well group. So I want this IWSW12A. I'll click on it and select it. And maybe I'll call this IWSW12A. So now, like I mentioned, when defining particles like this, you're defining these stacked circles or rings along the wells screen. So one parameter here is what the radius of these rings are. Generally, the higher this radius is, the larger apparent zone of contribution that you'll get. So it's good to keep this relatively small. Now there's the number of particles for each circle. As I mentioned, typically mod path runs pretty quickly. So there's not really any reason to use a small number here. For sake of demonstration, I'll just put it at 40. And now for the number of particles along the screen, I would definitely recommend using at least two circles. If you only use one circle, the circle will be placed at the center of the screen. But if you use two circles, it'll be placed at the top and the bottom of the screen. For demonstration, I'll use five. 
And now for the particle propagation, I can leave this all in the defaults. So they're propagating backwards and are being released at the end of the simulation. So as I was explaining during the lecture, this is essentially calculating the path lines of groundwater flows that ended up in a certain location. So I'll select OK. And now we can see in the interface, if I scroll in, we have this circle of red dots here. I need to scroll really far in to make it obvious that it's red dots. And if I take a look at a 3D view, so we go to a window, 3D window. We can see that we've got these five rings of 40 particles each, starting at the very top of the well screen and ending at the very bottom. So I'll close this. Now I've basically done almost all of the hard part. So I'll go to the single run step. And once it loads, I want to select particle tracking here. Visual Modflow Flex supports two particle tracking engines. One is ModPath, which is released by the USGS. There's also ModPath 3DU. So this is a third party software. As of the time that I'm recording this, it's a free software, but it needs to be downloaded separately. And the advantage of using ModPath 3DU is by using this, you're able to do particle tracking with unstructured grids in ModFlow USG. So if you're working with unstructured grids, which have a lot of advantages, especially for doing particle tracking, I would definitely recommend downloading that. So now I'll just move on to the next steps. I'll translate the model. And now I'll run it. So we can see that we've got two different tabs here. This first tab is for ModFlow NWT, which is the flow engine. And the second tab is for ModPath 2000, which is doing the particle tracking. And we can see that both of them uh, completed successfully. So now if I go to the view map step, we can see that we've got this new output under the outputs node here. So under path lines, and I can select it view these path lines in 2D. I can also view these in 3D. So I'll go to Window, New 3D Window. I'll find my path line outputs and select them. And I'll also add in the ground data object here. And maybe also my well. Now to actually extend this analysis, I can export these path lines. These path lines have some options. so. As you can see, they have these, these little nodes on them. These represent, uh, by default, 365 days of travel time. So going through each one of these points along a path takes one year. I can change these. So if I right click and select path line options, I can change the intervals of the tracking markers. So maybe I, could, I want it to be 10 years, and select that and hit apply. Or I can bring it down to say 30 days. This, by the way, is, is probably a good idea if, if you plan to export these for further analysis. It's good to have a higher resolution when you're analyzing them in GIS. So I'll hit OK. And now to export these, all I need to do is right click on it and select export. So now I can just find a place to export them to, maybe here, and I can save them and open them up in GIS. OK, so now I have my processed mod path data here in QGIS. I'm only going to be describing what I did here very broadly. This is supposed to be a Flex tutorial, not a QGIS tutorial. But briefly, what I did was I extracted the origin points. So these were the points on the path lines that were the oldest. And these are these red points right here. And use them to calculate the zone of contribution. So that's this darker black polygon. Maybe I can put up a graphic on screen right now, just briefly explaining what my workflow was. And I also used the full point data set, which represents the 2D projection of the uh, capture zone, and use that to calculate this second zone over here, this zone in gray, which represents the area maybe where you'd be concerned about the effects of DNAPIS. I could have gone even further here, you know, maybe done something like calculate the contours within the zone of contribution for, say, the five year, 10 year, and 20 year zone, which some regulators would want you to do. But anyway, that's everything that I had for this video. Thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something.